Um, so yeah, as Ms. Tariq mentioned, by the time we're done, you're gonna be able to do a lift and curve cryptography in your head. <laughs> no computer's necessary. Uh, so who am I? I am Mike Belchi, uh, CTO co-founder of BitGo. Um, BitGo, we do secure multi-signature wallets. Um, been doing that for, I guess, closer to a year now than less than a year. Um, but before that, I was an early Chrome engineer. Anybody heard of Speedy? Yeah. A couple of people? Okay, yeah. Um, so I was a co-creator of that. Um, now it's become each 2.0. So for the last couple of years, I've been involved pretty heavily with securing the web. Um, and some of that fits naturally with what I'm trying to do at BitGo. Um, for that, I, I did a little company called Lookout Software. I don't know if you heard of that. I bought from Microsoft 2004. Okay, so here's what I was thinking we could talk about. Um, Tariq asked me for super highly technical. So I was going to deep dive into the blockchain, how signatures work, um, help you put them together. You can see like the low level details. The documentation, I think, is scant uh, at best out there. Um, I might even mess up a couple of things, but I think I got it right. Um, and hopefully you like the presentation. And then I'm going to go through some, some APIs. So I'm trying to put together an API service on BitGo that does signatures and multi-signature stuff. And if you want to build great apps on it, come and talk to me. I've also got Gavin McDermott sitting right there. He works with me. Uh, if you have any questions about BitGo, um, he will help too. Um, anyone object to this? Last chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, a Bitcoin transaction. Um, it's actually shockingly simple. Um, sometimes you might think there's metadata in it of some sort. There's almost nothing in it. Um, it's pretty much pretty much nothing but um, a list of inputs and a list of outputs. Um, so who, who here is familiar with transactions? You ever looked at them? Okay, it's pretty familiar. Um, just a couple things you need to know. You know, the sum of the values of the inputs more or less has to be equal to the out sum of the outputs. It can at least be a little bit more than the outputs, which you can't, of course, have inputs, which exceed your outputs. Um, other than that, there's not much to this. So what does an output look like? Each of the outputs that you have, and by the way, on this, I have one output and two inputs, just for, for grins. Um, okay, so each output is very simple. It has a value in Satoshi's, and has this little magical thing called the script pub. Who knows what the script pub is? Okay, a couple people, good. All right, well, <clears throat> inside the transaction, before, in order to get verified, it's gonna have to have a fully complete script uh, that's going to be verified by all the miners, and that's going to happen before it goes actually into, into the blockchain. This is half of the script. I've given it the name the deposit script. I wish they named it that. I don't know what you guys think, but it really has to do with I'm depositing this, this set of Bitcoin through this output to some conditions of withdrawal. Um, so it's kind of like a deposit. All right. By the way, all these little data structures, they're kind of they're circular, so they're going to come back around. Inputs and outputs, so they're sort of the same, they, they have to work together. Inputs. Um, so these are the inputs of the transaction. Anybody that's trying to contribute Bitcoins in has to say, hey, here's a reference pre prior transaction. There's a hash of it. And remember, we can have multiple inputs on a transaction. You saw two on that, in that first one I showed. So you have to say, transaction hash number hex 50, output index number one. So it was the deposit into some prior transaction that we're now going to use as the um, as a withdrawal from that transaction into this transaction. And then we're going to add this little thing called the script signature, which is also a little piece of do. And that's the second half of the script. I like to call it the withdrawal script. These two things are going to work together, and this is how we're going to prove that we own the Bitcoin and can move to another address. All right, so just to put this kind of all into the transaction chain, um, I've created just a simple little depiction of a few transactions here. So let's start with one. Uh, I call this transaction A1111. And this one has no, no inputs and one output. Now, who knows what kind of transaction that might be? The Genesis, Genesis block. Genesis block, a Coinbase. <laughs> yeah. Those bastards are Coinbase. And, you know, Coinbase is actually a term, it's not just a company. Um, but this is a Coinbase. Right? So there's no input, this was created by the miner, it's his reward. It must have been done some time ago because he's getting 50. These days you only get 25. Um, there's a couple of miners here, right? I met one. But it's not necessarily the Genesis block. Right? It's any of the Coinbase. blocks in the first four years. Oh, correct. Yeah. Correct. Here. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, it's any Coinbase, right? Genesis actually refers to this as the very first block. Sorry. Brain there, but right. 
Okay, um, so let's say we now have a second transaction which wants to consume the output from that first transaction. In other words, we're spending. All right, so the transaction, I called it B2222, um, has an input which refers to the prior, and it's going to split it into two chunks, output number zero, output number one, 25 bitcoins each. 25 to 25 is 50, and we have 50, so that's all fair. There's no fees going out at this point. Let's get a little more complicated. We'll take an input um, this time, which is not the first one. So the inputs, remember, they have two things. You have to have the hash, and you have to have the input in the index number. So in this case, it's number one, number two. Um, this time, we're splitting it into two. We're splitting it into five and 20, because we started with 25 as the input, five and 20. So making sense to everybody so far? I'll do uh, one last transaction here called the C4444. And the reason I put this up here is to demonstrate that the transaction can have multiple inputs. And in this case, those inputs are actually coming from different prior tra transactions. Um, we're taking output number 0 from 2222, and output number 1 from 3333, and combining those. Together. Finally, the last thing you have to know about is the unspent. So anybody that writes wallet software is a little bit familiar with unspent trying to construct a new transaction, you're going to be constructing some inputs from only things that are unexpected. All right, so the transactions. So going back to that first transaction, we kind of had uh, this Coinbase transaction, which had 50 BTCs, which we're trying to, to split into two, two new outputs of 25 each. So what's going to happen is first, we take the script hub key from the old key. That's what I was calling the uh, withdrawal script. Um, and we're going to append it to the script signature. Right? And this is hard to depict. It's kind of like they actually go one in front of the other. Um, so it's kind of like bytes from here down. I tried left to right, up down. Everything's a little confusing. But those two together are now the actual script, which is what the miners are going to use to verify that this transaction is legitimate. So the script signature is provided by the guy that's trying to take the money. And the uh, pub key was provided by the guy that deposited the money. And then we're going to run this as a stack of commands as a script. So what is a script? The Bitcoin scripts are pretty complicated. How many of you looked at the opcodes list for scripts? OK, a lot of you good. All right. Um, I just put some random spattering up here. There's like, like 80, I think, that are listed. <clears throat> kind of on the, on the wiki as possible. I think um, a good chunk of them are not implemented at all. Um, and this scripting language is pretty complicated. On one hand, the pieces that we use are simple. But if you go and dig back deep in the blockchain, you'll find places where people went crazy and tried to experiment with this and that code. And there's all kinds of crazy, crazy scripts out there. Um, and over time, it's led to the, the, the decision that we really need to have kind of these standard transaction types. Um, and the reason for that is because these scripts can get arbitrarily complex. There's really no, uh, nothing other than policy in Bitcoin D that says what size scripts are OK or not OK to run. Um, and if you just accept all of them, they've actually got some bugs in them. And then sometimes you hear about, oh, it's not a Turing complete language. Anyone define what a Turing complete language is? <clears throat> we are computer scientists in here, right? No? All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> Turing complete would mean, I guess you know all of the possible end games for how a script could run. You know all the possible options. You can take a look at it and say, provably, this is going to end when. <coughs> and this is not a Turing complete language, which means you know someone could write a little loopy thing that goes on forever. And the miners don't like that. They want to get on their way with mining bitcoins and collecting money, right? So who wants to run this forever script? And of course, we've all seen there's these little tiny transactions, people trying to DOS the, the damn network all the time. Um, so having a not Turing complete language with arbitrary types of scripts turns out to just be um, not really that interesting for us overall. <coughs> um, now, how many of you have heard of Ethereum? <coughs> right. So Ethereum, you know, you read their marketing page, and the first thing they say is, we have a Turing complete language, and that's going to solve the problem. And they probably solved something interesting. This is a little bit of a pain here, so if anyone's got a strong opinion, <laughs> debate me. Um, <coughs> But they're trying to sell smart contracts. And if you're trying to make a contract that you can codify in the blockchain, you need that actually pretty good scripting language. You might want to be able to take you know, data from, the ex from outside the blockchain, like the current price, and do this on that, and whatever. And they've come up with a different scripting language, which they think is more provably 
uh, correct and measurable so that it could actually be run in a mining type of situation like with Bitcoin. <coughs> they might have succeeded in making some improvements on it, um, but uh, overall the scripts are going to get pretty complicated and the miners are going to have to run through them and they're going to have to have limits on how long they can run and things like that. I don't think it's that interesting of a problem to solve. I think you could do a lot here if you wanted to. It's just that right now with the phase of where Bitcoin is, we're struggling just to get exchanges to work. So trying to get uh, arbitrary complex scripts to work is just a little bit beyond us right now. Anyway, standard transactions. So how many different types of standard transactions do you think we have on blockchain right now? What is a standard transaction? Four. What? Four. Four. It's pretty close. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's three actually. So if you look, and I guess if you if you look in the what like what is standard, it's a little bit of a, it's kind of a trick question. There's like types, and then there's things which make you a non-standard transaction because it's too big. Um, so that's a little bit different. But the first one is kind of the oldest. It's like pay to a public key. It's still used for the Coinbase transactions. It's where your script pub is basically going to just say you need to be this pub this. Um, this public key and then check the signature on it. We'll go into how this works in the next slide. The second one is pay to pub key hash. This is one that we mostly use. So your address that you see, those 20 character long strings, they're basically a version number, um, a hash, and a checksum. That's what they're composed of. Um, and this is the little script which is used to verify it. And then lastly, it is multi-sig, M of N. So it seems like multi-sig's been around forever, but it actually hasn't. Um, it was actually introduced in BIP 11, and I forget what date that was. Two years ago? <laughs> Not that long. Anyway, those are the three main ones that, that we have today. So the need for P2SH. The existing standard transactions require the transaction creator to decide what the script pub is going to be. So. At creation time, do you want to have to put in the spending rules for wherever you're sending it? Um, and what we wanted was a way to let the receiver specify the script and have the guy who's sending the money, um, depositing the money, not have to know about what rules are going to be required for, for withdrawal later. And this is where P2SH came from now. Um, and, it, oh, right, right, right. And one of the big motivations for it was actually M of N transactions were not part of the existing software. And how are you going to get everybody to support this new script format? You have to wait for everybody to roll out the software. Um, so if you can instead turn it on its head and let the receiver decide how the script is going to execute, then you can have much faster it off. Just kind of specify this once and be done. And it would apply to all transactions that are going into an address, so to speak. It's a little bit of a fudge compared to the way the blockchain thinks of it, but it's the way people think of it. All right. Um, so this is where pay to script hash or BIP16 came along. So <coughs> what was I getting at here? Um, the deposit script is a fixed format. This is just describing what BIP16 says. Yeah, OK. Um, so remember I showed those three standard formats? There's kind of a fourth one, which is the P2SH. It's actually not on a per transaction basis. It's instead what's going to happen whenever you deposit into a P2SH address. Um, and then the withdrawal script is going to be a little simpler. It just has the signature, actually it should be S because we're giving signatures, um, and then a serialized script. And that's actually a second script. So when they came out with BIP16, there was actually a fair amount of controversy around it because um, it's, it's kind of a bolt-on, um, actually. We have this nice scripting mechanism. We've got the deposit script, we've got the withdrawal script. You put them together, you run them through the engine. And this is like a second script that you then have to reset the little state machine and run again. Um, but the reason it was, it was picked up, Gavin liked it in particular, um, and uh, it makes it just a lot simpler. It allows us to keep these nice, simple addresses that are pretty much similar to what we already had. Um, what's the first digit of a... Pay to, pay to SH address? Three. Three, right. On the test network? <laughs> Two. Good. Yeah. Um, so we actually had to version the, the address space in order to support this. Um, but uh, So it's a, it's a little bit of a bolt on, but it is actually pretty, pretty convenient. Um, it's finally codified in April 2012. 
Um, it replaced the odd eval proposals, and I think there's another couple of proposals out there at the time. All right, so what do I do? Um, so I combined P2SH and MMN. And in a way, they were kind of designed to do this. Um, but it's actually really nice. Now we can start to get a couple of big, big features. First off, multi-sig, we all know what that does. It allows you can require multiple signatures in order to unlock a transaction. And if you have those multiple signatures happen on different machines, then you can actually provide a lot more security. So every server out there is pretty much vulnerable to a server attack. And every client out there is, is vulnerable to, to malware. Um, I spent, uh, as a Google, a fair amount of time on Chrome security. Uh, Chrome's got sandboxes in it. That was not created because somebody thought it was an arbitrary, whimsical thing to do. It was because they have a crawler that crawls the net and sees the six million new viruses that are dropping out onto the network every year. Um, this is serious business. So we knew that if your machine gets owned, the only thing you do is reinstall. You're screwed, right? <clears throat> Unless the virus writer is not a very good virus writer, you might actually be able to remove it. But um, for the most part, once you're hacked, you're just hacked. Anyway, client-side software, even though we like to think it's not vulnerable, it's very vulnerable. Um, we have malware all over our machines. Something like 30% of home machines are compromised at this point. Usually with relatively benign stuff that might steal a credit card number and sell it for pennies on the dollar. But I guarantee you that all those guys have been stealing credit card numbers for the last you know, 10 years and so on for cheap are retooling to go after Bitcoin because it's a much more lucrative game. <clears throat> So the P2SH does the second thing, which is now, we had M of N for single transactions, so maybe you have your money, your Bitcoin, in a single key address, like you always had. You could have used a multi-sig transaction with it, but it doesn't protect all your Bitcoin, even though you're constructing this nice multi-sig transaction where you're gonna make sure that you have a signature over there and a signature over there. Um, somebody else can just steal the one key and then steal all your money, right? Um, so individual multi-sig was one thing, but P2SH allows us to tie multi-sig to every withdrawal that happens on that address. And that's the two things together which help make the security much, much better. Um, if you want to extra credit later, I wrote a whole paper on that thing. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> how many, yes? Can you just explain the pay to part? Pay to script hash? Yeah. Yeah, so um, in fact, the old type, was called pay to pub key hash. So when you have an address, an address is actually got three pieces of data in it. One is a version number, another is a hash of your public key, and the third one is a little checksum to just make sure it all hashed correctly and it's grouping the bytes in there. Um, and so with a, with a pay to script hash, which is uh, this guy, um, this serialized script, and I thought I had it in here somewhere, I must have taken it out, maybe it was in a different slide, but what that script is going to be for multi-sig is it's going to, um, uh, the multi-sig is M of N, so first the script says the number M, and then it has pub key, pub key, pub key for the three keys, if you use the three key system, the number three, um, and uh, that's the script. Um, and then it says it's off, check multi-sig. Um, but if you take a hash of that thing, that's what goes into the address for a P2SH address. So whereas a standard address is a hash of a public key, a P2SH, pay to script hash, is a hash of this script. That's what the pay to script hash is. Yes. Multiple or multiple pub keys. It would be a hash of multiple keys instead of just one. Right, the actual script itself contains, it's, uh, it's basically a bunch of constants, multi-sig. You push the constant, if you were doing a two or three wallet, push the constant two, push pub key one, push pub key two, push pub key three, push the number three, and then finally run an off check multi-sig. Um, and they take a hash of the bytes in that script, which is what goes into All right, so how many of you are coders? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> how many of you cracked open Bitcoin D? Good. Uh, Bitcoin J? Who likes Bitcoin J better than Bitcoin D? <laughs> right, sorry. You can't, Bitcoin, you can't run Bitcoin J in fully validation mode. Yeah, only because there's so many bugs in Bitcoin D. <laughs> <clears throat> Alright, there's a number of multi-sig uh, transaction um, API providers out there. It seems like every day somebody new is announcing, they're saying they're the first. 
Um, I say I'm the first. I think I was first. But I swear, I see one every day that says they're the first. <laughs> I know I was the first before that. Um, anyway, we have some APIs put out. Um, we, we have a lot of simplifications to do on these. Uh, I put them in some, in some slides here. You're welcome to try them out. Uh, just contact me if you do, and uh, we'll work something out that make sure that I get any bugs fixed for you. But I'm using all of these the, in, in my own service, so they're pretty solid on the back end. They're just not as pretty as I'd like them to be. All right, so we actually kind of have a, an SDK. So we're interested in being able to do multi-signature where we always force that you do signatures on two different machines. Um, you could do multi-sig all on one machine, but then you put all your keys on one machine. So it's kind of a core principle that thou shalt never have two keys on the same machine. So one of the, the APIs is JavaScript, because we're using the browser for that. There's a lot of convenience there. Um, JavaScript is scary for crypto. Um, some people say never, ever, ever, ever do that. There's some, some mitigators to that. If you want, we can talk about that. Uh, and then the service API is kind of a, it's just an HTTP REST with sort of C thing. All right, so anybody use Bitcoin JS lib? Never heard of it? So I forget yeah, who did it. Uh, Mike Hearn. No, he did the Java one. Stephon Thomas. Yeah, Stephon Thomas did the original version of this. That's right. Um, so Bitcoin JS has been out there for a while. Um, it hasn't really been very well maintained. I think last time I had an update from Stefan was a couple of years ago. Um, so it just kind of got abandoned out there. There's a number of folks, myself included, that have picked it up and started modifying it. Um, the one that I've done is here on GitHub under the BitFiddle. If you want to help out, um, it's all open source. We'd love to have your help. Um, the thing which we did is we added multi-sig support. Had a lot of bugs. Didn't support multi-sig. Didn't support P2SH. We added that. Um, by the way, P2SH, um, when, when we got started uh, on this project, the first set of customer complaints I had was always the same thing. Hey, I tried to send money into your account, but Bitcoin, uh, I'm sorry, blockchain.info says that uh, it's an invalid address. And that's because the address format for P2SH changed, right? The version number, that three instead of a one at the beginning. Um, pretty much all the wallet software out there was not tooled for P2SH, even though it's been in spec for like a year and a half. Um, that's quickly been changing. I've patched three or four of the systems, and then others have been doing it too now. So it's, it's it hasn't been a problem for a month or two. All right, so I've got a couple of key, key uh, classes in there that are used if you're going to be doing um, transactions, uh, multi-sig transactions, bitcoin.address, bitcoin.ect, and bitcoin.transaction. Here's a little bit of JavaScript. Um, the first line is just a declaration of a constant for a standard address. The second one is a P2SH address. Um, you can kind of verify that an address is valid if you're writing any software. It's a common thing that you want to do is just verify that you're an address. Um, and then down below, I have a second form of it. It's not very interesting code, but it's just basic um, Bitcoin address manipulation. Um, if you grab this JavaScript library of running browser, run node, um, runs in both places. I got some utility stuff in there. In Bitcoin world, you'll be doing a lot of conversion to and from hex and byte arrays. Um, double shards, common algorithm, random bytes. Um, I think this PRNG is actually really good. Um, you need to be careful about this. I can't stress it enough. Um, I uh, started my career at Netscape many years ago. We did SSL, and then, you know, I don't know, five years later, you know, the PRNG still isn't working, bugs being found in it, you know, hacks all over. Um, it's just hard to get right. <clears throat> the thing I like about this one, picks up the library from Stanford, um, SJCO. Uh, they do a nice JavaScript crypto library. There are a bunch of security experts, Dan LeMay is there, a number of other well-known industry experts. Um, what I like about it is that as we start up our product, if we start up this library, if you're in the browser, it'll immediately start collecting mouse events and start collecting keyboard events and feeds them in as entropy into the PRNG from the get-go. It's going to tell the difference between a cat and a human? Can't tell the difference between a cat and a human? Yeah. No, there's a difference. <laughs> well, I know, from the input. Oh. Entropy. Is there a difference in entropy? <laughs> I haven't measured that, but that's a, that's a, that's a good front. <laughs> All right, EC key stands for elliptic curve key. Um, Anybody want to hear about elliptic curve? Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. So what is elliptic curve? Uh, well, elliptic curve is a, is a more modern generation of um, 
public-private key cryptography is pretty much replaced with RSA uh, a couple of reasons. Um, the main one is that the number of bits required in a key to maintain the same level of protection uh, between RSA and elliptic curve is very different. And what they found is, you know, we, it used to be we did RSA with 128-bit keys, and it's 256, and it's 512, and it's 1024. You know, now the recommendation is 2048 bits of, of, of key. And the reason is because as they figure out how to factor those prime numbers, um, the advances in hacking are faster, accelerate faster than the adding of bits. So those are just getting kind of too big. You know, 4K long keys is not far away. Um, it's not very fun. Elliptic curve has been hard to get going. So there was a company called Suricon, which uh, claimed for a long time to have all the patents on all elliptic curve ever. Um, and uh, the particular algorithm that we use inside of Bitcoin is believed to be non -pat not patentable, uh, not covered by the patent. Um, and there's actually been a couple of court rulings that start to support that as well. Um, I don't know of any current pending patent litigation on this front. I'm not sure who you would sue. Um, anyway, um, I guess you could go but out there. But there is a potential that there is a patent liability regarding that elliptic curve algorithm? That, that's a question for a lawyer, not a technologist. <laughs> Do patents have well, it's not zero. Technology? Evidently, there's, there's, some, there's still some, there's some entities that are still legally contenting that, that idea. Absolutely. Every big company, Apple, Google, et cetera, has considered can we use elliptic curve. Mm. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a big consideration in the last 10 years. I thought it was like a missed standard or something. No, this one is not in this standard. Um, actually, I don't know the specific question. I might be wrong. So, um, yeah. But anyway, so elliptic curve, uh, that's, that's the big difference between it. I'm sorry. Well, there's a, the underpinnings are the big difference of, uh, between that and RSA. But that's the reason why it's used. And the thing which is also really nice is that it's fast. Um, now, what goes into creating a private key in elliptic curve cryptography. Anyone? Oh. I forgot. The two <laughs> 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 no, it's just the private key. No, no, the SHA-256 is Bitcoin. Big random number? Yeah, random stuff. Big random number. <laughs> it's just four bytes, it's 32 bytes of randomness. That's, that's it. So all you have to do is generate a random number. And what it is is the, the elliptic curve, there's a number of curves that mathematicians have figured out have good <clears> properties. Um, and there's a certain way that you can kind of cross the intersection of the lines, which is beyond my expertise. Um, but the part is interesting is actually the curve is known. And with Bitcoin, it's SecP251. Sec I forget the, the name of it. There's actually a name, kind of registered, known, good, crypto, good elliptic curve algorithms with um, the properties we want. So when you pick your private key, you're really just picking a random number, which represents an XY, which they're going to run through this thing, which which intersects in an interesting way. Um, and that's, that's it. Anyway, so it's really fast to create keys, uh, which means we can create as many as we want, which means we can recycle addresses all the time, which means you, know, you can create two or three addresses or whatever. Um, you know, really good problem. Um, I think that's probably about the depth I can give you. Any other questions on EC? I thought we are going to be able to do this in our head. I don't fly. Sorry. <laughs> Don't tell me you have your money on my coffee. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Painful. Um, OK, so Bitcoin transactions. All right, we've got some, some classes. I wrote a little helper function just for this presentation called creative transaction. This is a piece that I should simplify in my SDK and API. Um, but remember, a transaction, if you're going to create one, you've got to have some inputs, you've got to have some outputs. Um, in this case, case, I created one that just has a single input. Um, and I added a single output with value. Um, I don't do any validation on that whatsoever, um, but this will create the basics of a transaction. Now, if you were to do this, there's a whole bunch of stuff missing. Like, you know, where do you get this input <coughs> transaction, you know, um, and output index information? <coughs> Usually, you know where you want to send it to. Usually, you know how much you're trying to send, but how do you know that this is, is, is enough? Yeah, what's the Satoshi's? Value in Satoshi's? <coughs> value in Satoshi's, right. Um, I guess it's my variable naming scheme. I like to actually put the units on there so you don't think that it's BCC or something like that. Didn't Mark do his value in Satoshi's as well? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's key. I mean, it's in the protocol, right? 
right. this is the way the book is written, the Bitcoin works. So. <coughs> um, so that's the basics of creating a transaction. Um, I'm going to skip this one and come back to it for a second. Uh, oh, I can't do that. Okay, sorry. I'm going to that. All right. Um, so then you might want to sign the transaction. Um, this is, is kind of designed to show you what a signing might look like if you had a um, two or three multi-save. Um, you'll see this redemption script up there gets passed in. Um, we pass in the signing key. Um, you're going to create up an elliptic curve based on your private key. You're going to call this function sign multi-sig, which needs an array of keys because you might be applying multiple signatures to it. Um, you're going to pass in the redeem script, and then we'll take care of the rest. That's my API. But no. That pop up. Signing key is a private key. Yes. Sir. Okay. Good. Good. So that's about what is a redeem script? What is a redeem script? Make it up. What? The script you need to redeem the Bitcoin? That's <laughs> correct. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. So we'll come back to the uh, I'll, right. I'll get I'll come back. So sneak preview. The problem is remember like we're making this work across multiple systems. So we've got this is the kind of the client side, maybe it's your it's in your browser. All of this stuff is happening locally. Um, your keys are local, everything's on your machine. So your machine get hacked, there's only one key there, it's no big deal. The other key is up on the other side, it's on the server. Um, if it gets hacked, it's no big deal. You should you know, clean it up once you get somebody hacked, but um, at least your Bitcoin are not stolen. Um, now we'll do the service API and then we'll see what the redeem script comes in. So this is my service API, which needs a little bit of work still. Um, that's where you'll find it. It's all JSON based. All right, I even have curl scripts in there. I'll send out these slides and you guys can hack around on it later. Um, and then on the, the left side, is, it's kind of a curl thing that, that, that does a login. And on the right side is a response. It's a user response. Basically, in order to use the site, you have to actually log in. Once you've logged in, you might want to create a multi-sig wallet. Let's see if you can do that. Um, and this is kind of the stuff that I keep. This is the public information about the address that, that I returned back in this case. The top, you see, the extra, this is on the test net. So it starts with the number two. That's a testnet uh, P2SH address. Uh, it's a Bitcoin address. You're watching it by default. Um, private, I X that stuff out just for the point of here. Um, and that uh, redeem script, there it is again. Um, it's a spending account. It's some other kind of stuff you do for wallet stuff. I don't know how much money is in there. Unspent. There's a lot of guys doing multi sig transactions right now, but actually having an API for multi-sig without addressing unspent is only addressing half the problem. So in order to compose a transaction, you have to know which accounts you're gonna, which transactions you're going to be taking funds from. And this is what we call the unspent. Um, Blockchain.info has an API for this. You can call it just kind of web service. It's not too different from this. Um, but basically, it's a way where you can look up kind of by address. Um, so you have some Bitcoin address, either a page script hash or just a standard address. And you say, give me the unspent for this thing. And basically, it's going and looking at its database and finding all the ones that, that look to be unspent on the blockchain. In my case, I like to return the entire raw transaction so you can pull it all out. Really, all you need is that redemption script. And then signing a transaction on the service. So what we do is we have you sign one half of it on your browser. That was what that signed transaction in the JavaScript was. And that's only a half signed transaction. You can now send that up to the server, and the server's going to apply the last signature on it assuming everything's good. And the great thing about having a service do this is that the service can start to do the same thing that Visa and MasterCard do, which is that we all live in San Francisco, so if we see a transaction that's being originated from Moscow, we can probably say, hmm, this doesn't look so good. And we can apply that. It's completely off blockchain, has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but having those types of services on top of um, the existing blockchain is actually where we all be. Um, there's a curl if you need it later, um, and the operation is actually pretty simple. All it needs is an input, is the uh, hex encoded fully signed. Uh, and it's in the set fully signed, it's kind of the half signed, that's what that's supposed to be. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that was the response. This is the half signed transaction, that's the fully signed. Anyway, so I, that was the end of my slides, but I did want to go back and make sure that we covered that redemption script. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea is, is that uh, you provide a service that where you have the other key to a transaction that I want to do, and I'm on a computer that's completely compromised, it's polluted, 
um, I click on every pop-up that, that comes up, for example, and I do a transaction and I sign it with my key, um, but that doesn't do the hacker any good because you have sent right. it to you and you then sign it with another one, presumably you're not hacked, and then it goes through. Yeah, you know that. So either side can be hacked, but unless the hacker is invading both machines, both machines. and colluding between them, right. you should be okay. There are, uh, there are a million types of attacks, so to simplify it that way, I'm not, I'm not that naive. There are isn't, isn't there another possibility where you could have, let's say, an, another key and a USB that basically you just um, you just send a transaction to the USB, it signs, I guess the, the way the Trezor works. Trezor works this way, yeah. Right, so you could be completely, so maybe I could even do a three-way where I could have a Trezor, my own signing key, plus you, a service like you to do a transaction. That's right. Um, so but if I lose the key, what if I lose the Trezor key then? <laughs> so <clears throat> M of N comes in, into play here. Actually, one of the biggest problems um, I think we have even with this, is people just forget their pass passwords. You know, right. There's a lot of speculation that Mt. Gox might have just lost their stuff. I don't know if that's true or not. But I've certainly had several people come to me that said, I lost my passcode. So if you use any type of address, whether it's a single address or a multi-sig, where the number of signatures required is equal to the total number of signatures on the transaction, like one of one, two of two, three of three, then if you lose the passcode on any one of those keys, right. you're screwed. So the thing which is nice about the 203 system is that actually when you create it, you can take one of those keys and go and stick it in the safe. And it's never going to be online. Maybe it's printed out. Maybe you never had you know, any of the completely separate. Mm -hmm. but that's, it's like a, that's like a backup. That's your backup. Right. And now, as long as you don't lose both of the other two, and if they're hosted one on the service and one on your machine, there's a pretty good chance you won't lose them both, um, then you're OK. And so that's, that's actually Well, maybe you could do two of five, where you have three offline somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you can still lose two, right? And then go grab. Yeah, you know. it's it's almost perfect, right. except for there's a little gotcha. So the standard transactions. Um, now, as it turns out, the code in Bitcoin D does support M of five, um, and I can't remember if it's limited to twenty or if it's limited to size. Um, but there actually there is a there is a large limit. Um, but the standard transaction is actually limited to M of n, where n is three. three. Okay. Which means, so what does it mean to be standard, by the way? Standard is kind of a, well, an agreement among anybody that's doing mining, you must support standard transactions in order to be a good player. Now, by the way, there's nothing that enforces this, right? A miner does not have to obey the rules, but they're supposed to. So being a good citizen, you should do that. So if you're um, uh, doing really big transactions with M of 5, mm -hmm. then it may or may not be it. But as it turns out right now, Bitcoin D is what does it. Bitcoin D does support that, so yes, you can do those configurations. Five. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Uh, I think all the way up to twenty. That's my my recollection. I might be wrong, but it's a big number. But it's not standard, so you have risk of code changing and no longer supporting that. The BIP sixteen, which introduced P 2 SH, just locked it. And it was a concession, I believe, to the miners. So miners are concerned, right? They don't want to run too many signature checks. So even with these, these even with lifted curve, you know, it's expensive to do these, um, the verifications. And doing more of them makes it so you go slower, and they didn't want to have too much. So, yeah. Yes? Um, so is there a way for me to verify that, let's say using your server, yeah. that, like, so you're giving me this code, right? And then how do I confirm that, like, that isn't just a private key you generate? Totally this. Is there a way for you to do that? Um, there's not. But there's ways for you to create that such that you generated it off of two public keys that you control. So um, there's a trade-off between security and convenience, um, which is a big problem for usability in Bitcoin. And maybe I just haven't cracked the nut yet, so I apologize if there's a new solution. Um, but by default, what we do is we create two keys, one which you square away, and the other one just on the server. Actually, we create all three. The other one's waiting for now. Um, but we create them all for you. And that's just because you probably don't know how to, how to, how, how to create a key. Yeah. But if you do know how to create a key, all I need is the public key part. I don't need the private key. I never need the private key. I'm doing that for convenience. So there's, on the account setup, there's an advanced. Yeah, I saw that. So in there, you can contribute your own key if you want. So is it weird for me to verify that you use my private public key in your service with service side code once I'm all, all finished? There is. What you would do is you look at that redeem script that came back up in that API, and you would dissect it, and you would see the exact bytes of your public key. Okay. And you can verify that that hash is true hash, and that would kill the manager. Okay. 
Um, on the outputs of a multi-sig wallet, who signs the outputs? On the outputs of a multi-sig wallet? Um, if I put the money into a multi-sig uh, address, and there are outputs that come back to me, because I put in, let's say, you know, the last transaction, which is one Bitcoin, I really want to only send half a Bitcoin, and the outputs come back, and be signed cryptography, right, and verify mm -hmm. the, the chain. So who signs that? Okay, so what that was is actually had two outputs. So you had an input, let's say it was 10 Bitcoins, and you were trying to put eight of those into a P2SH address, and then two of them are going back somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So those two are going to wherever it was. So if you have a wallet that returns it to the originating address, then that's a second output, which is not going to the P2SH at all. It goes back to you. Um, and this is actually an interesting problem when you look at the blockchain. So um, it, it's impossible to differentiate change from an actual transaction. And it's very common that you, know, you, spend, you have a $10 bill and you spend eight and you return two. Um, but when you're just looking at it on the blockchain, it just looks like a spend of 10 where it went to two different addresses. Um, so, but, but did I answer your question? No, well, not quite. Um, when you have a multi-sig address that you're sending to, the multi-sig address to you know, take out the funds that are sitting in there and to send them on somewhere else, you have multiple parties sign off on that right. transaction. So, if I have a multi-sig address uh -huh. and I have one individual that puts money okay. in there, how does he get his outputs back without having other signatories? You don't need to. So anybody can deposit into a P2SH or a standard address, just, just like always. So even if you had a single key, right, anyone can deposit into it. You just give the public address of it, and you can deposit there. And the same thing is true with the P2SH. So it's just an address. It starts with a 3 instead of a 1, but everything just works. So in that case, you had 10 BTC in your P2SH. You sent 8 to somebody else, and you wanted 2 back. The 2 that come back is just... The same address, it doesn't go back to new address. Oh no, it can do either one. You have, you have both choices. Just like with a standard address, there's nothing specific to P2SH there. You can return change either the same, yeah. same account or different. But if you want it to a different account, then you need your bulk with that backup and you have to make a lot ah, of... Ah, great, great question. Yes, so this is something I've been working on. So uh, BIP32, everybody knows what BIP32 is. We talked about it. <laughs> we covered it. We covered it. The last, that was the last topic, I think. Bingo. Hierarchical deterministic wall. So <laughs> hierarchical, ignore that part. But deterministic is actually the, the important part. So elliptic curve cryptography has this great, great property. And you can take an existing key, existing private key and public key, and you can make a mathematical operation to each of those two independently and come up with a valid key pair. So what this means is you started with key number one, has public key, private key piece, right? And with just this thing, you call it a chain code, you, and you only need to have the public key, you can take my public key and this chain code and create a new public key. And me, with the private key, you just tell me what the chain code is, I'll take my private key, apply the chain code, and get a new private key, and it will be corresponding to the, private, to the public key that you created. So RSA you can, can't do that, or RSA, that's one of the things that RSA can't do? Is it, is it another advantage of elliptic curve? It's your main two. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, you can do it too. Okay, so here we are. We're answer. Um, so the, the great thing about deterministic wallets is now you had your kind of one key that was backed up. As long as you know what the chain code is, you can create more, multiple keys. So the same way that we're trying to make it so you have one passcode to protect your public key, your private key with standard addresses, and then return change and yet always rotate your addresses. You can do the exact same thing with P2SH. Um, it just happens to be more complicated because you've got three keys instead of one key. Um, hmm. But the same math works. And you figured that out. So. And you have already figured out how to do that. I don't have it deployed yet, but yes, um, we do have it figured out. Yeah. It's actually a pain. <laughs> Hmm. All right. Um, I have another question. Yes, sir. Um, so on your site, you support um, data limit transactions. Mm -hmm. working on it. Mm -hmm. Is that how does that work? Uh, there's a couple different types of limits, and this is actually what we're trying to do. Is a, about a month, I think it's a big release on this. Um, we're trying to make it so that corporate treasuries can work. So I sold a million dollars worth of Bitcoin to a small company, to actually a reasonable sized company, and the CFO barked all over it. And it took a couple of weeks to finish this deal. The reason it took a couple of weeks to finish this deal is because 
He needs to have control over the Bitcoin. He can't just have some you know, low-level guy that has the key to Bitcoin. You know, no company operates this way. Right? So without um, having kind of corporate controls, there's really no way for businesses to store safely their Bitcoin. I spoke with another guy. He's doing a tremendous amount of retail. He has about a half a million dollars in inventory of Bitcoin. He's a CEO. He has the private key. His wife is the backup. Right? I mean, this is not the way we want corporate governance to work. Nobody likes this and, and, and such. So anyway, um, <laughs> what we're working on is a set of features that are related to um, partnerships and larger businesses being able to get spending limits. So like any individual can sign with just, uh, sign for up to $1,000 or whatever you like, which is one key, and then BitGo signs the second one. But if you try to do a larger transaction or more per day, then BitGo will refuse to do the second one. Um, and well, you have to do something else. This isn't, this isn't in the actual um, certificate scripts. This is on your scripts. Yeah, it's, it's all just in the process of managing. So this is all on the blockchain, right? Um, but how you manage all these signatures and notify and make it usable by people is what we're doing. So we're, we're, we're kind of tough. There's a, there is a value to individuals as well, which shouldn't be overlooked, which is, um, you know, if you ever are compromised, if, you know, somehow somebody gets in and um, gets your key, um, get your, maybe, maybe it's your phone, right? So you've been fished and they stole your phone, so they've got your ability to do two-factor off. So they can log into the service. They're here in San Francisco, so the geography checks don't, don't, don't fail. You got $100,000 in Bitcoin there, they can walk away with $100,000 in Bitcoin. This doesn't happen on your ATM because you got a $300 limit on your ATM, right? The same thing applies here. All they can get is 1000 bucks, and you're gonna get notified that that's not gonna happen. Um, so it's useful for, for, for the rest of us as well as it is for the court. But that's what well, the other thing you could do is lock out. You could immediately make a phone call and lock your account out, right? Yeah, actually there's a whole bunch of these, right? So you can do time delays, you can do approval requirements, uh, you can just block it. Um, yeah. So there's, a, I mean, there's now with this, with this, you're basically the third signatory, you can all of a sudden add a whole bunch of rules and services on top of that, that's right. other than just being a security. Yes, that's what we're doing. Wow. Yes, sir. You say something about these uh, time delays. Is that something that comes from the Bitcoin script itself, or is that written on top, or what? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I s glossed over it. There was a lock time in that transaction, and usually we said it's a negative one. Not many people are using it, I don't think. Maybe some people are using it. Um, but the lock time has to do with the height in the blockchain at which point this thing can be mined. Um, and uh, I wasn't planning on using that at all. Actually, this was a slightly different purpose. So um, in this case, imagine you just say, I don't need any of my transactions to happen in real time. I'm willing to wait an hour. Give me a chance to, to veto it, right? Um, so what happens is somebody hacks into your account, tries to spend $50,000. You uh, get notified, and the transaction just kind of sits in limbo. Our servers won't apply that second signature until time has gone by, and approval has happened, or something like that. that this, that's the delay I'm talking about. So when it's only half signed, it's not, it's not valid on the blockchain. But it's because the BitGo Bit server is... That's what I'm doing, yeah. Okay, so it's right. <clears throat> you could also do something with the lock time. I that's thought that might have been disabled. That was, I thought that was disabled. I don't know. I don't know either. Does anyone know? Yeah, uh, and lock time is disabled uh, in Bitcoin because of uh, some sort of DUS hack. Yes, sir. So, in, in that situation you just described, how would you verify whether the transaction should or shouldn't be verified if someone's hacked and got your credentials? Like everything is a everything is a trade-off, right? <clears throat> so, one thing is to put in the protection, where you're going to notify the authentic owner. Um, presumably, he gave you phone number for that to happen. So, is that that's currently manual or doesn't exist? Or? I don't think anybody has these today, so these don't really exist. <laughs> But, but those things go on the blockchain, so those rules, all of them are kind of written in the block. No. No, these are, these are written in PHP. There's nowhere, yeah, yeah, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to put them on the blockchain. Oh, I hope. Okay. So think about it, right? I mean, show me, you saw the transaction, uh -huh. right? And where do you put? How about the script? How about the redeeming script or something? There's nothing in those scripts. There's no opcodes, which are go send an email to Bob. And oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but what I thought there could be, like, you could, you could say, okay, um, if someone tries to spend this transaction, wait uh, six and other confirmations, unless something else happens, and then send it or something. The time delay can be done that way, yeah. 
so yeah. have to work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It could be the, a service like that down on top. Well, the lock time has allegedly been. Yeah. Because no one's had to say yeah. So, yeah, so well, that for that reason it wouldn't work. But. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. You know, is it possible to create an N of N of M transaction or no, pay this cash, cash, multi sig, such that it isn't any pair of keys, but only a specific subset of pair of keys that could. Um, is that different from a two of two? Um, yeah, so for instance, suppose you have keys A, B, C, D, and you want it to be able to unlock with A, B, B, C, or C, D, but not with A, B. Uh -oh. Nope, doesn't work that way. Just, just count. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. You could, you could apply your own logic on top of another mm -hmm. multi sig system, mm -hmm. um, but it would be okay, a I think there will be non standard ways to do it. Ah, that's correct, actually. That's a good point. Yeah, you could do a non standard transaction. So that complicated scripting stuff, you could try to create your own. Um, that that might work, but nobody will accept it. Like no miners. Will. No, that's not true. They might. So like might. Eligius tries to accept everything. That's right. Um, so uh, he may not be able to. Yeah, but he will try. And then of course you're dependent on those miners that that accept the non-standard transactions um, in order to get in order to get mined, which means you might it might take longer for you to get your transactions out. So, but, but the opcodes provide for. Even if they're not implemented. Uh, yeah, there's a ton. There's a lot of functionality in those. <laughs> there's really too much functionality, which is why the standard transactions are kind of enforced. Um, I mean, if you look at the crazy signatures that are on the blockchain um, historically, I mean, there's transactions that are on the blockchain that should not be there, that are bugs that were found as a result of a transaction getting through, and current mining software looks at it and vomits, but it's already in the blockchain, so you just have to accept it. Um, <laughs> it's happened. This has very much been a uh, an experiment. Yes. So, what uh, wallets, public or private, would accept P two S H, and when do they accept? Uh, pretty much everybody does now. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody that doesn't. Um, actually, I don't know of any that don't right now. So, I think we have a fix. They always. This blockchain are They do. Good. They took my patch. <laughs> <laughs> So, but basically, your service is, is an alternative or competitor to Ethereum, in a sense. No, I don't think so. Ethereum is an, is is uh, is a new scripting language. It's a new everything, um, and they want to make smart contracts possible in a way that we haven't made them possible on Bitcoin yet. So, um, if they if if their language is good and better, they may they may be successful in that. Um, you've seen how the scripts here are kind of locked down to a few standards. There's a bunch of others you can do, and your mileage may vary. Um, but uh, they're hoping to make it so that scripting language is much more predictable. And, and BitGo is so to complement what you're trying to do. BitGo is not really related. You know, BitGo is kind of sitting on top of the chain. So um, we're adding application level stuff, like you've got an organization, right. you've got two guys, and you know, they need to co-approve each other and stuff like that. That would apply equally on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Is uh, BitGo hiring? Oh. Yes, we are. We're interested in working on multi sig stuff. It's really fun. Um, we got major UI stuff coming. We are going to change Bitcoin laws, but I'm not sure. You can ask that. All right. Let's wait. Thanks.